Our scripture today is from the Gospel of Matthew. And we're going to be reading from the first chapter, verses 18 through 25. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother, Mary, had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband, Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had born a son, and he named him Jesus. This is the word of God for all of us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, I have some family in town this weekend. just want to introduce you. Uh, we have four kids staying with us this weekend. Uh, one is three. Uh, we have Sadie, who's five. And then we've got Lily, who's 16. Eight. eight. Sorry, eight. eight. <laughs> <laughs> and then we've got Wyatt, who's a teenager. He's uh, 15, correct? And he's already taller than me, which is really depressing. So. Uh, but anyway, I think we started a new tradition last night. Because when you stay with Aunt Lou and Uncle Ru, uh, you go to the beach. And uh, we're synonymous with the beach. If you have out-of-town relatives, they like coming to visit you because, you know, they go to Wilmington and you get to go to the beach as well. And so we did that last night. We went swimming in the ocean last night. Actually, the intercoastal. Uh, you know, they wanted to go. I think they maybe even brought their swimsuits. And we held hands and we ran into the intercoastal together. We took the polar plunge. And uh, had a great time, and I think this should be a tradition, guys, don't you? I think it should. No, maybe not. <laughs> but my guess is that a lot of you are gathering with your families, and you got some really unique traditions that you do as well. Maybe you're reaching out to old friends, people you haven't seen in a while, and, and you're, you're, you get together and you do the same things every year. Uh, any of you have traditions? Maybe it's not like that, but maybe it's another kind of tradition like that that's really unique to you and your family. Yeah, a few of you. And so today I want to talk to you about family. Today I want to talk to you simply about the Holy Family here in our scriptures, and especially Joseph. And you know, I've often wondered about Joseph. If he, as a young man, when he was planning his life, when he was thinking about what kind of family he would have, I wonder if he didn't say to himself a different kind of vision. I wonder if he didn't pray for different kinds of things. Uh, as a pastor, I, I do get a lot of youth and college students and young adults who come to me to talk about their relationships. When I was, did youth ministry, I had a lot of youth talk to me about you know, who they were dating and, and their, their heartbreak. Uh, and I say, you know, heartbreak can be good. Heartbreak can bring you closer to God and to others and, and give you discernment. When I was 19, I had my heart broken. I was dating this girl for about four months, and we were at the South Point Mall in Durham. We were at Barnes & Noble. <laughs> and she said, I gotta talk to you, Russ. And the way she said it, I knew she was gonna break up with me. Thankfully, she didn't do it at the Barnes and Noble, because that would have ruined Barnes and Noble forever. forever. <laughs> she said, let's, let's talk outside. So we walked along the Barnes and Noble, and, and that's when she broke the news to me. I don't know why she did it then, but she did. And, and I was pretty distraught. And I had to drive back to my, my dorm room at, at school. And, I was so upset that I actually drove the wrong way. I drove the wrong way for an hour and didn't realize it. When I got back and woke up the next morning, my father woke me up with a phone call and said, "Hey, I just met someone who knows your girlfriend. Excited to meet her." <laughs> well, that's not gonna happen. <laughs> but that was pretty heartbreaking. 
I'm sure a lot of you can look back in your life and see ways that, that God intervened to stop you from being with this person, to stop you from going from down this path or going in this job. Today, I am grateful for all the prayers that God said no to, not just the prayers that God said yes to. When I look back in my life, I see all the prayers that God said no to, and I am even more grateful for those. Because when you're young, when you're 19, when I was a teenager, I was still going to play NBA basketball. <laughs> and there, as I grow up, there are things where I said, man, I am so glad God did not give that to me. Today I have an incredible wife who's just, uh, she's just so incredible, and, uh, I just, and her family as well, and, and I can't imagine my life without her. And I'm so grateful <laughs> that God didn't say yes to some of the girls that I was dating. They're all wonderful girls, but... Our paths were different, our lives were different, and it would never work out. When Joseph was a young man and he was planning his life, I wonder if he envisioned a different future for himself. Maybe he said, I just want to live a normal, quiet life in Bethlehem or Nazareth. But that was the opposite of what happened, right? He became this eternal figure, someone that we read about every single year. He had no idea what God was going to be doing in his life. And so today I want to talk to you about family and prayer. Family and prayer. Specifically the, the prayers that you have for your family. Because my guess, as you gather with family this holiday season, my guess is that you have spent a significant amount of time praying for them. As we all do. And so I want to talk to you first about Joseph. One of the most mysterious characters of the Christmas story there's a lot that we don't know about this guy, specifically his age. There's been this long debate in Christianity about how old he was when he got married. In the fourth century, it was widely held that Joseph was an elderly widow, someone who had been married before, who was now way up in years, but who was now getting married to Mary. And that sort of, doesn't, with our sensibilities, we don't sort of like hearing that, but in the fourth century, that was the most commonly held belief. Uh, the Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, Martin Luther, the Reformers, John Wesley, who founded this denomination, believed that Joseph was an elderly man when he married uh, Mary. But today, scholars believe that he was just a couple years older than Mary. And so, generally, we believe that he was actually a teenager when he got married. <laughs> he was also a woodworker. But we don't know necessarily if he was... Uh, the grand woodworker who, who had a lot of business or just kind of a local woodworker who just sort of made furniture. Our best guess is that he was kind of a humble woodworker, that he just made farm tools, that, that he made furniture. When Jesus says that my yoke is easy, he's speaking about an image, that he, uh, an image of something that he made with his father. You can sort of see Joseph teaching his son how to build a yoke. We also know that Joseph though he is mentioned 16 times in Scripture, has zero lines. Even though an angel spoke to him four different times in dreams, he had zero lines. He's this kind of quiet, unsung hero. There's something symbolic about that. There needed to be someone in this story who didn't have any lines, who hid behind the scenes quietly in the background and did the hard work. And yet we know as a society that we are so influenced by our fathers that our fathers teach children a lot of things. And maybe even if you didn't have a father growing up, maybe you had a father figure of some kind, someone who mentored you and showed you the ropes. I, I just want to take the next half a minute, turn to your neighbor, and I want you to tell them what you have learned from your own father. Whether it's a biological father, adoptive father, father figure, turn to that person and tell them, what did you learn? What positive thing did you learn from your father? Why don't you do that now? My father growing up, my father was buy these pickled pig's feet in a jar. <laughs> and he had this like really weird way of eating them. This is, this is how he would unwind at night. He'd come back from a late meeting. He'd be like 9 or 10 o'clock. And, and he's trying to relax, watch the ball game. He'd break out the pickled pig's feet. 
and he'd pull, pull them out. And he, he would hold it, he'd pull it out of the jar, he'd hold it in his hand, tip some ketchup, squeeze it on it. And he didn't like eat it like a normal person, he'd lean his head back and kind of drop it in. He did what the hot Yeah. I didn't, you know, the father teaches us what not to do as well sometimes. <laughs> and I did not pick that up from my dad, and I, I definitely don't do that in my life. Uh, but one thing that my, my own father, my biological father, and I've had some other father figures in my life too who have been like fathers to me as well, but one thing that my biological father really taught me is that he, throughout his whole life, has been really patient with people. Uh, he has been extraordinary. He has this remarkable patience. Someone could get in his face, yell at him, and he could just keep a calm demeanor, speak rationally and reasonably. When I was a teenager, I thought, Dad, why don't you just tell them what you think? Give them the truth, man. Just, just tell them exactly how you feel. I was like, you know, no, son, there's a better way to do things. Patience is important. And I didn't see that when I was younger. I do now as an adult, and I tried to profit off his example, as I'm sure he learned that from his father, my grandfather, who was exactly the same way. There's great value in patience. And so, when Christ unfolds the parable of the prodigal son, and he talks about this image of a father who is playing the role of God, and he is patient and merciful, I wonder if he's not just thinking about the heavenly father, but also the earthly father as well. Maybe he saw that in Joseph too. When Jesus teaches about humility, and he talks about that being the path part of the Christian path, maybe he's thinking of his father, his earthly father too. Someone who worked hard. He didn't have any lines in scripture. He worked behind the scenes, working quietly to provide for his family, expecting no recognition. Maybe he saw that in his earthly father as well. And so we learn a lot from our fathers, as Christ did. And finally, one of the other mysteries about Joseph is we've often wondered about where he went to in Jesus' ministry. It's most likely believed that he probably passed away before Christ began his ministry at age 30. And there's a lot of uh, stories about this. Uh, one in particular comes from a book called The History of Joseph the Carpenter. This is not canon. This is not in your Bible. It's apocryphal literature. Uh, but it's more tradition. It's more uh, legend than it is actual canon. But in this story, it talks about how Joseph, when he married Mary, he was 93 years old. And he died when he was 111. And so he had all of these children before Mary, and, and on his deathbed, these children are coming in and out of the room, and they're crying over Joseph because he's about to die, and Jesus was the one constant. He was sitting there the whole time holding his hand, and when Jesus sensed that Joseph was about to take his last breath, Jesus called down upon the two great angels, Gabriel and Michael, to come and take Joseph to heaven, and that's what happened. And when that happened, it said that Jesus laid out in the bed, and cried uncontrollably for his father. Now, we don't know if that story is actually true, but it's not a stretch of the imagination to envision something like that happening, where Christ is uh, speaking to his father on his deathbed and saying, don't forget, I am the resurrection. And if you believe in me, you will always live. And so you get a sense for, for what the relationship would kind of, kind of be like. But Joseph is most famous for the passage that Pastor Emily just read. This critical moment when his fiance tells him that I am pregnant and the father is God. <laughs> now, now, let's be real. If that was told to you by your fiance, how would you react? <laughs> probably with a wide range of emotions and probably most likely in disbelief, as Joseph did. But today, engagements, you know, they're more frequently uh, decommitted from than they were back then. Today, you know, it's not uncommon to hear about an engagement breakup. But back then, an engagement, it happened. And it was pretty much locked. I've only had one couple I was doing pre-marriage counseling for. and only had one couple where I said, you may want to second-guess this. Because they, they really, <laughs> you may want to think about this. As I asked the, 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 the guy who was getting married to this, this woman, I said, do you want to get married? He goes... <laughs> and I said, maybe we need to talk. And what happened is that there was no commitment in their engagement. They just said, let's get engaged. But back then, it was the opposite. To get engaged, it was a big deal. And so to get engaged, and this is a little nuance we often miss, uh, back then there was an exchange of money between one family to another. The groom's father 
would give a significant amount of money to the bride's father because essentially he was taking uh, one of his workers from his household. Someone who would be working for a wife, oh, he, he needed to sort of pay for that. <laughs> and so that was a, the, the cost of today what would be a small house. And so it was a major investment for someone's son to, to marry into another family. But not only that, Joseph would have had to give Mary money as well. Because it was traditional back in that day and age that Joseph would give her money, and she wouldn't spend it on a diamond ring, she wouldn't spend it on anything. She would use that money, she would tuck it away, and she would use it just in case Joseph died early, and she would have something to, to kind of fall back on. And so there was a big financial commitment to this engagement. And then once that money has been exchanged, once the two families have come to an understanding, they would gather together and they would sign a binding legal document saying that this uh, man and this woman would be married. And so when you got engaged in that day and age, it was a big deal. It was locked. There was more commitment in the engagement than there was in the marriage itself. And so when his fiance tells him that I am pregnant and you are not the father, as he already knew, he had a tough decision to make. Now, the easier path, of course, would have been to say publicly, she's pregnant with another man's baby. We're done here. And then maybe he can get that money back. But then, because he was a righteous man, Scripture says, because he cared about her, because he didn't want to see any harm come to her, because it was punishable by death to do what she did, he said, I'm, I'm going to divorce her quietly. And in doing so, he was forfeiting all of that money that he had given her and the family. In doing so, he was accepting in himself the dishonor, the public dishonor. Because they're going to find out that she was pregnant. And you know what people are going to think. That's his baby. And once he impregnated her, he left her. And so he is running the risk of taking on all of the shame for himself. And then maybe never getting to marry again. Because who would want their daughter marrying somebody like that? And so when the scripture says that he decided to divorce her quietly, that was a major, major action. That was a major decision that impacted his life negatively for the long term. The scripture says that he was a righteous man, but we did not need the scripture to tell us that to know that. That was an extraordinary decision. But then once he did get married, and once he had our understanding about who this child was, he didn't become the biological father, did he? No, he become the stepfather, the stepfather. I like to say that Joseph is the patron saint to stepfatherhood, to being a stepparent, to being an adoptive parent, to being a foster parent. And I know that a lot of you have assumed that mantle, have gotten into that challenge maybe, where you said, you know what, I am going to be a parent to a child that's not biologically mine. Well, let me tell you this, Joseph was there first, and your calling is a challenging calling, but it is an appropriate one, and it is a meaningful one. And even though uh, God, Jesus had a, his Father in heaven, he still needed an earthly father, someone to teach him the basic things of life. And Joseph took that responsibility. I would imagine that it would be hard for any step parent to hear, and this may be the worst nightmare for any step parent, for a child to say, you are not my real father, or you are not my real mother. Imagine if you're Joseph, <laughs> and Jesus says that, and he's like, yeah, he's a better guy than me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> your, your real father is a lot better. <laughs> but I imagine for all of you who know the struggles of being a step-parent and being an adoptive father or adoptive mother, uh, my, my uh, take heart, because Joseph was there first, and he is the patron saint of that. <laughs> and so in the Catholic tradition, there's this, uh, they have this way of worshiping this this moment, this way of bringing out the beauty, and not in this moment, but throughout the life of Joseph, and worshiping Christ, and recognizing that in this holy family, there is both sorrow, and there is both joy. In fact, the Catholic Church lists out the seven sorrows and the seven joys of Joseph, and they say this, they remember, re remind us of this during this time of the year, they said, for Joseph there was great sorrow when Mary was pregnant. But there was also great joy when he found out that he was going to be the, the earthly father of Jesus. There was sorrow for him when he couldn't provide a, a room to, for his wife to give or his uh, bride to give uh, birth in. But then there was joy when the, the, the Christ child did come. 
There was sorrow when he had to watch his son get circumcised, but then there was joy when they named him Jesus. There was sorrow when the prophet Simeon said that he would suffer greatly, but then there was joy when they said that he would save the souls of the world. There was sorrow when they had to flee to Egypt to escape King Herod, but then there was joy in knowing that he was saving the Son of God. There was sorrow when he knew that he was going to be living under oppression from King Herod who was looking out for him, but then there was joy in the home life of Mary and Jesus. And there was sorrow when he lost teenage uh, Jesus, or teenage, 12-year-old Jesus in Jerusalem, but then there was joy when they found him teaching in the temples, teaching the elders in the temple. And so the Catholic Church, what they've done here is they've said, you know, in Joseph, in his life, and in the life of the Holy Family, there is both sorrow and there's joy. These two things, they, they go together. And in our families, too, there is both sorrow and there's joy. There's challenge and there's peace. There's turmoil. And then God can use that and redeem it for good. And so we look to the Holy Family as an example for our own. And we say, it is normal to have sorrow. It is normal to have challenge. Yet in this day and age, you recognize that people are opting out. They're leaving families. They're leaving community. Sometimes it's justified, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes people abandon their families because it just gets too hard. But we follow the example of Joseph and seeing that in great sorrow, in great challenge, if we trust God, there can be joy that comes from that. Not just our biological families, but also our broader family, even our church family. I remember at my first appointment, they had a, a, a church, it was a church that was about 170 years old, and, and they had ministers, they had a big wall of pastors, of, of every, a picture of every minister who had ever been there. And they all had these you know, crazy facial hair and the mustaches that turn and like these big long beards, you know, and, and uh, it's just interesting sort of looking at the long history. My face is not on there because I don't want it to be. And they still email me and say, we need a picture of you. I'm like, I don't want to be in that wall. But in that long, rich history of the church, there are people who have been there their whole lives. People who are baptized there, confirmed there, married there. Their children were baptized, confirmed and married. And some of them have even watched the, the, the burial of their spouse at this church because they've, they've been there their whole lives. Every major event happened through that church. And, and they would tell you that there is great value in sticking with people, in, in believing in others, in, in sticking through sorrow, in sticking through those challenging moments. Again, sometimes it's justified, but sometimes God calls you to stay and to trust that he can turn great sorrow into great joy. And if we often, there, there's this... Uh, a phrase that we often use about people who go from one church to a next or one community to a next. They, they never settle down. And, and the church, they call them church hoppers. Like they go from one church to a next. They never, they never commit. And, and that's a phrase for people who just, when they find imperfections in others or in institutions, they say, oh, I don't want to deal with that. So they leave. But the true value in sticking with a family, and I always tell people when you, when you join Harbor, Harbor is not just a place where you worship. It's a family. It's an extended extension of your family. But if your philosophy of life is to leave people every time they give you resistance, every time they make your life challenging, you will wake up one day and you'll realize that you don't have any deep connections in your life. And so we stick with each other. And so we stick with our families. We do our best to prop one another up, one another up and we do our best to, to, to persevere and to trust that God can turn this season of sorrow, this season of challenge into a season of joy. I have a colleague in ministry. He was, I first hired him as my youth minister a few years ago, and then he became a student pastor. He's, I think, finishing his last year at Duke, and he's serving a, a small rural church. But at the beginning of this year, 2018, uh, in the middle of the night, his church completely burned down. It was a church that had been there for generations. Like over a hundred years, this church had stood, and in one night, the whole thing was done. It was pretty sad for this community. And it was devastating for the people who had been there in that church for many years. And so they were faced with a lot of challenges. Where are we going to worship? 
And it's been difficult for them because they haven't been able to find a permanent, temporary location to worship until they can rebuild their home. So all year long, they've been hopping from one community center to another, going from one place to another. That puts a lot of stress on him. He's in his mid-20s, and he's having to deal with this. And it also puts a lot of stress on the congregation. But not only that, then there was this little storm that came through named Florence. And, and when Florence came through, he was a volunteer firefighter. And so he goes out with these guys, and he's <clears throat> rescuing people from rooftops. He's going to all of these homes, trying to get people out before the flood comes. While he is doing it at his own home in the parsonage, the church's home, his wife and their newborn baby are at home while the roof is caving in. And water is pouring in through their ceiling. And so they were, they were okay, but that was happening as well this year. And I was talking to him about this, and he was telling me everything that he had been through. And I, he said, this has been the best, worst year of my life. I said, the best year? I said, your church had two structures, and both of them are gone from fire and from flood. And he said, yeah, but this year I had the birth of my son. It's a pretty amazing thing. And he said, you know, we've lost some members because they just couldn't handle the moving around. But he said, I am so grateful because I think it's given us a whole new appreciation for church. We have felt the presence of God even more worshiping at a YMCA than we have anywhere else. We feel so much better as a church than we ever have been. He said, the insurance company isn't giving us enough money, and we don't know when we're going to build again. But this family has stuck together, and we're going to see some joy. And he had such a positive attitude about what was happening in his church. That's the example of Joseph. That's the example of the Holy Family. I wonder how many times Joseph said a prayer and God said no. I wonder how many times Joseph said, please don't let us flee to Egypt. But God said no because that's where you're going to be safe. Please don't ever let my son, my son suffer. But God said no because he's going to save the souls of everyone in the world. I wonder how many times he said, please, let nothing bad happen to my family. Let things go easy. And God said, no, this is the best thing for you. I am grateful today more for the times God has said no to me than God has said yes. And so as we gather with family this holiday season, my guess is that some of you have had some fires and some floods in your past. You've endured some things in your, in your past. But my advice to you from the Holy Family my encouragement to you, my invitation to you is to trust that God can bring joy from anything. That God can bring joy from fire and from flood. That God can bring joy from sorrow and challenge. Believe that God can bring joy this Christmas. Will you pray with me now? God, we give you thanks for the great examples of your servant Joseph who had his life turned upside down completely by your son, Jesus. And yet through all of that sorrow and through all of that challenge, he stayed faithful and he trusted in you that things would work out. And so help us to do so for each other. Help us to bear with each other, to have patience with one another. Help us to have patience with our family, to continue to pray for them, to never give up on them, and to trust that you can turn anything into joy. We pray all these things in your name. Amen.